You're tuning in to another Sister Sister show tonight. Thank you for listening. I'm your host, Sister Ashley. Mother Jennifer is not with me tonight, but I have Sister Chris Muir. If you're familiar with the names and the faces of the ministry, Pastor Daniel Muir, his principal wife, is with me tonight. Hallelujah. Let's get a sound check from you, Sister Chris. Shalom, shalom, sisters. Um, This is Sister Chris, and um, I'm happy to be here. Praise yeah. So, we got 54 days until Passover and exactly seven Shabbats. Some of us have made it thus far. Praise Yah. I want to thank him for knowing the righteous and for the few remnant that are still holding on, keeping their hand on the plow and not looking back. I do want to throw this out there for the feast coming up. We are accepting any paper goods that you are willing or able to serve or send. I'm sorry, send send or bring. We don't have a be a blessing during Passover. It's usually a shorter feast, but we are receiving hefty supreme plates and bowls, any Ziploc bags, and 8 to 12 ounce cups, 8 or 12 ounce. If the list has any additional items, I'll say it within the upcoming weeks on the show, but paper goods are always needed. Thousands and thousands of paper goods we go through, so if you're able to bring it all, please Um, Just throw it in the cart, send it this way, ship it this way, or bring it in your car. Um, Any announcements, um, Sister Chris, from you, just any shaloms, acknowledgments, something on your heart before we kick off our conversation. Thanks for joining me tonight. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to acknowledge the Most High Yah for calling me. Um, out of darkness and out of this wicked and perverse generation just to um, walk in truth and holiness and righteousness. I'd like to acknowledge um, my shepherd, Pastor Dow, who my husband, uh, Daniel, you led me to, uh, to listen. I'm grateful for the ears to hear. Um, I'm grateful for um, the mothers in Israel who have taught us so well and, um, I'm just grateful for all of my sisters here at Goshen. I love you all dearly. Hallelujah. Thank you again and again for coming on. Um, Mother Monty's probably smiling. She really enjoyed our last interview, our last chat with Sister Chris, your growth, your maturity, your love for the Father. I know it's going to shine tonight. Um, Let's kick it off. You ready? Yes, ma'am. Hallelujah. All right, back in 2019, I went on a Sister to Sister show, 8-15-19, a Q&A with Mother Carol. And Mother Carol said, what is marriage? I have her notes from that show, 2019. So I'm going to read to you her answer. Her answer was, a covenant relationship between a male and a female, as a direct reflection of Christ and the church. Yah is teaching us how to be with him on the other side of this life, here and now. Does anyone have it down perfectly? No. Every marriage has trials they go through. It is something you are constantly growing in. This society has taught women that sex and attention is love. These are ways to show love in marriage, but they are not the basis. If a man is impotent, can he still love you and show his love for you? Yes. If a man is away from his job, if he has a mission and away from his family, is he not able to show you attention? Yes. Does he still love you? Yes. You're not going to know every aspect of marriage if you've only been married for just a few years. You haven't been through anything yet. This is Mother Carol, who met Pastor Dow in 1983. They met and have been together for 40 years. They married June of 1986. I was 
four. And they've been legally married for 37 years. But what is polygyny? Well, polygyny is the marriage in which the man has more than one wife. And to save you any of your study or physical time, how many people in the Bible have multiple wives? Many. You can find them. It is our culture. Esau, Jacob, Elkanah, David, Samuel, Solomon, Abijah. Those come to mind. And so do some of the men of our Hebrew Israelite faith. It's our culture. We're not Mormons. We're not Church of Latter-day Saints. We're nothing you've ever seen before, honestly. And we're nothing to fear. Hallelujah. We are restoring the Bible and living it with great fear. And I hope tonight to bring out the topic of polygyny that is very intimate for Sister Chris. It is very, it's spoken up very highly from her lips. It is her way of life. And I'm encouraged to be able to interview interview you and speak about it, Sister Chris. Um, the mic is yours. I do have questions. We'll go back and forth through the night, but go ahead and um, share the verse or any direction that you would like to go, but the verse that you gave me comes to mind earlier today. Go ahead. Yes, ma'am. Um, i like to first um, also acknowledge my sister, Ajani. Um, I've learned so much through um, her as my sister, a sister wife, and um, and our husband is just so righteous and teaches us so often, and um, I'm grateful to have um, them in this journey. And what I realized from talking with other sisters at times is a lot of the times we focus a lot on what it is that we would be missing out on when it comes to polygyny or what it is that um, we would lose and not instead what we would gain. And so a scripture um, sticks with me from Sirach, and it is um, Sirach chapter 6, verse 14, and it says that, and I'm, I'm going to change it just a couple words, and you'll see what um, and why. And um, so it says, a faithful friend is a strong defense, and she that hath found such a one hath found a treasure. Nothing doth countervail a faithful friend, and her excellency is invaluable. A faithful friend is the medicine of life, and they that fear Yahweh shall find him. Whoso feareth Yahweh shall direct his friendship aright, for as she is, so shall her neighbor be also. So, um... It's a lot that I would like to say from that as well. So, Sister Ashley, if you'd like me to continue, I can I can go from there. Please continue. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So, um, when I when I read that scripture, it makes me think about my relationship um, with my sister wife, and I think about what it means to have a faithful friend. As we've heard from um, our shepherd, Pastor Dow, that we as women don't have friends. And uh, I would say that's true Coming prior to coming into the ministry because we spoke about it a little bit when I was on the show before. I mean, a lot of our friendships are very generic and uh, not genuine at all. You don't really have a closeness with women because you get close enough and then eventually, you know, something will go wrong. Um, somebody will say the wrong thing. Obviously, someone's offended. And then you just don't talk to them anymore. And then you put a wall up and then that's that until you move on to the next friend. Um, but when you have a sister, um, a faithful friend, um, she is like a strong defense to you. It's like, you know, when I think about Aji and I, I know she and I, we have each other's back. And not that we're like against anyone else, but I know together we're just stronger in that way. And that's the way I would like for um, the sisters to even think about polygyny is having a, a close sister, closer than any other sister that you would have, um, just a faithful friend. Um, and there's a treasure in that. And um, and 
it's it's just invaluable, like the scripture says. Um, and even with that, when you go to verse 17, it says that whoso feareth Yahweh shall direct his friendship aright. So aright means correct. So a mature woman should be able to lead the friendship in a correct way. You would be able to guide and mentor, um, steer the friendship in a positive direction. You can set the tone for what the friendship should be like from the beginning. You know, you have an opportunity to to decide who you want to be in this in this friendship, and you can decide that from the beginning, and you can steer it in that direction with your sister. And it says, for as she is, so as I am, so my sister, or it says my neighbor, but so my sister shall be also. So I have an opportunity to be an example to my sister that she can also be the same way. Hallelujah. I'm encouraged to finally be able to talk to you about this. This has been something I'm sure that you um, may have wanted to even hear yourself. Can you tell me how many years that you've actually known? um, He's pastor to me, but uh, Daniel, many years before he was appointed and ordained a a pastor, he was just Daniel to you. How many years have you known him? Yes, ma'am. So um, (laughs) before he was pastor, um, I've known him since I was 17 years old um, in 2003, if people are doing math here, figuring out how old we are. Um, I met him as a freshman in college, and um, we were then together several years before we were then legally married in 2009. Hallelujah, 2009. And how many uh-huh. years have um, have you been a polygynist? couple is that what you would say would you call it a polygynous marriage a union what's your terminology that's such a good question because when i think about it um like pastor i believe would be in a polygynous marriage you know he has multiple wives but i am a co-wife or a sister wife with my sister so um our my husband is polygynous, however, I am not. <laughs> so it's just, it's, it's an interesting way of life, and that's why I say that um, I really want these um, these conversations to be so normal. Like, this should just be such a normal way of life that we don't even have to really define what, you know, what that means specifically outside of this is the way my husband's house is. Beautiful. I think the audience needs to hear that. I have a lot of um, questions. I actually reached out to those within the ministry that live the the same lifestyle, and I wanted to um, present those questions to you tonight, but I want you to freely speak first. What's been your meditations? What's been your heart? Um, and unless you've said it already, what's some of the things that, that you would love to say so that nothing is overlooked tonight from you to those that are listening? Um, I just would like for the Daughters of Zion just to be encouraged uh, regarding polygyny. Um, sometimes it can seem um, like a daunting thing or you know, or like a plague that you don't want to come over you and your home, you know what I mean? Like sometimes it can have a, um, can seem to have a a negative tone behind it and not that that's what the men present because it's not, but I think um, because it can still be so foreign to a lot of us being that we've been raised in this culture, but I think it, it comes to a point where we truly have to decide, you know, that, we're just going to be different. We're set apart to the most high and we're going to embrace this culture. And I'm excited that in this day, time and hour, Yahweh has chosen me to be a part of his restoration. And I think that's what I would like to, to hear coming from the sisters, like just an excitement about it, like um, just a desire to want to see sisters covered, you know, to want to see sisters just like, I was just thinking about um, this past Shabbat. There was a sister here who was tarrying for the Holy Spirit. And when I tell you she was she was tarrying 
and you just felt the spirit, and it just moved me and so many of the other sisters just moved us to, to tears. I mean, because you wanted so bad for her to receive. You wanted so bad for the Holy Spirit to be in her because you knew that when it came down to that, she would be filled with more power, more might, you know, and would be able to do more works for the Most High, and, and you just knew it and you wanted it so bad for her. So it's like it's the same thing when you see your sisters who are uncovered. And and listen, Elder Rufus says it's so bad. It's like there's no sister in this ministry that is not covered. But when you see a sister who does not have that direct covering of a master who's going to teach her, um, guide her, protect her, lay with her, you know what I mean? You desire that for her as well. Like so um, the same way that you would desire for a sister to be filled with the Holy Spirit is the same way that I would want to see um, a sister's desire, our sisters, that we say we love so much to be covered by a righteous master. I think it's encouraging for those of you who do live it to have the strength and the maturity to speak about it because those who don't are going to follow suit. If you don't speak about it, then we won't, you know. And if you don't talk about it, then we won't. So this is a big day. It's opening a big, uh, it's it's not even, like you said, it's not a doom and gloom thing. It's us. It's we. It's what we do. It's it's the Father. It's his mind, his heart. Um, I want to share a verse and, and just a perspective um, before I go back to you. And um, it's in Hebrews 8. And it was the Most High who had his first covenant with his people, and he said that if that first covenant had been faultless, then there should be no place to have been sought for the second. But he found fault with the people, so the day had come now, which we're in, that he has made a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. And he put a covenant on our heart, Okay. So he put his laws into our mind, and he wrote them in our hearts, and he said he will be a God to us, and we shall be his people. And why this is fitting to me is because he found fault with the people, and you can always find fault with people. The Most High did. So you can find fault with a polygynous marriage, for example, and then turn around and fault the Most High for it. And it's not his heart and mind that you're that you should be blaming. You know, you can find fault with monogamy and blame the Most High. You can find fault with community living and homesteading and blame the Most High. Because even himself found fault with the people and rewrote or reestablished that covenant on the heart of the people. I hope that makes sense because I know depending on your visual examples or your experience as a woman, where you're from, what you're uh, used to, what you've been born into, I have something else to share on my phone. Uh, Speak to us for a minute while I pull something up, Sister Chris. Anything come to mind? Yes, ma'am. I think about just um, Titus chapter 2, where it says how the older women are to teach the younger women to love their husbands and their children, um, they are to teach them to think before they act, to be pure, to be workers at the at home, to be kind, and to obey their own husbands. Um, and then it, and it says, in this way, the word of Yah is honored. And so I think about that, and um, and and when you talk about us talking about this, and um, that's exactly what I think has has helped those of us who are. Uh, newly in a polygynous family, is that the counsel that we receive from our mothers in this regard. And um, I just pray that this um, just continues to be the desire for the daughters to just learn and grow and um, immerse themselves more into this culture and really divorce ourselves from the culture that we've been raised and reared in. Absolutely. I was looking for, um, this is a quote from 
uh, I have some different articles, books, and, and things I'm pulling from because I'm I'm pulling out your experience. And uh, one woman said that her being a co-wife as well, she didn't grow up knowing jealousy. She didn't know of jealousy. It wasn't of her or in her. And that's really, I think, just an awesome point to make. What say you? Yes, ma'am. Um, I think about when it comes to jealousy, that's something that um, women just have a hard time overcoming because this world just teaches us to be in competition with one another. Um, you hear women who say, I- I've never had um, friends who are female. I've never had female friends. I've only had male friends. And it's just because this culture just breeds jealousy. You look at another sister, or hopefully not a sister, but you look at another woman, and you would see her as your competition. And uh, one thing that um, Ajani would say is that it's just like when you when you think about having a sister wife, it's like being in a race, except for your sister is not your competition. She's your teammate. So you run with endurance to win, but you're not running against one another. And um, I think about, too, and we say it every Shabbat, we say the commandments every Shabbat, and we get down to thou shall not covet. And you think about that, and maybe sometimes you, you think that, you know, you shouldn't, you think about you don't want to covet something that's outside of, you know, maybe this y'all is speaking to to the men about this, but I consider it because, there was a wise mother who taught me that you should look at your husband at times like your brother, you know. So sometimes you have to see him as brother. And when the word when the uh, word says, thou shalt not covet your neighbor's wife, so I say, okay, I should not covet my neighbor's or my brother's wife. And that's the same thing as when I look at, let's say, my master and sister Agony. Like, I don't covet their relationship I don't covet what he might give to her or how he might be with her. I don't covet that either. So um, I think we should look at jealousy in more ways than just um, what we thought of as it is on the surface. Good point, because whatever you are raised with, that becomes your truth. So if you're raised with jealousy, jealousy becomes something you function in. And if you're raised without um, polygyny or the understanding of, uh, you know, biblical application of it, then, you know, you're going to function in, in contrariness with a different mind. So I always want to think like the father, you know. I want to think like the father. And I think those of you living this set-apart life understand him very differently than some of us who may not. Um, one question says, and these are from women living it, um, what's the difference from your early struggles of polygyny and then perhaps now or how you feel about it now, is there a difference? I think early on um, you you have thought, I mean, you wonder pretty much shallow things, if I can just be plain. It, it's really shallow things on the surface that you concern your mind with. Is he going to love her? Like, you hope he'd love her, but that's what your shallow mind thinks. Is he going to love her more? So then it gets, it goes a little deeper. Is he going to be different with her than he is with me? And then your mature mind is like, well, she's different than me. So, sure, he'll be different. And, and she'll probably bring out another side of him that I've not seen before. And your mature mind is okay with that. Um, in the beginning, you may have thought of, you know, is he going to lay with her and not with me then? And it just shows you in your mature mind how, again, shallow your thoughts are, and you challenge yourself and think about where is my worth? Like, is that where my worth is, lies in? Is, you know, some bedroom things? Like, that's ridiculous. So. Again, these are all vain things that we imagine in our mind, lots of projected fears. Um, and my husband, he's just, man, he's so wise. And those of us who have righteous husbands, like, we really need to listen to them. 
and let their thoughts be our thoughts and really allow for the things that they say to us really marinate in our minds because they don't just, men don't just speak like women do. We just speak, you know, but men are very intentional in their words, righteous ones especially. They're very intentional in their words. And it was times where, you know, I could bring things, these immature thoughts to my husband, and immediately he wouldn't entertain it, and he wasn't rude. He was patient and gentle. Um, And he would tell me, I don't think like you. I do not think like you. And it's just like the father where he tells us that his thoughts are not our thoughts, and we really need to divorce ourselves from those thoughts, really, really be transformed through the renewing of our mind and really hear what it is. I mean, if you need to record the words that your husband says, if you need to play them back and listen to them in your quiet time, like really listen to what these righteous men have to say and marry yourself with, marry your thoughts with those thoughts. And that way we can really get out of those um, immature what, things that, that we meditate on that really hold no substance. Can you agree that living this way, um, sharing your husband, but keeping your oneness with your covenant, can you agree that it has brought you closer to your husband after all you've known him since 2003? So now you've lived this set apart way with him for three years. Are you closer to him now? That's a good question. Um, I would absolutely say yes, but different than you may think. You know, um, I know him, and he knows me, and he knows what I need, and he provides very well. And he would say that he loves me more now than ever before um, because he would say that, his heart can safely trust in me. And when he speaks that way and I hear the way that he regards me and the things that he says about me, those are the things that I that I listen to and that I try so hard uh, to believe when the enemy is, is wanting to say other things to me. So we have definitely grown in our maturity. Um, our, we are completely different than who we used to be. Um, so we we know each other very differently now. Hallelujah. Um, of course, we've heard it before, and we're going to continue to say it, that our society and, and who we live around and live with um, and who we've been brought up with really dictates the way of our life. It's how we think. It's, it consumes us. It's everything about us. So when you come out, live separate, be separate, live set, set apart, and really start walking in the word, um, there's just so much respect that we should have for those of you who live this way. But at the same time, it, because it's part of who we are and part of how we are, it's just life. Like you said, it doesn't have to be some doom and gloom or some extra next level thing. It should be just who and how we are. But because the concept is so new to a, our American conscious, to our soul who who holds on to our mind, will, and emotions, right, Um Right now, at a point of restoration, that's why there's so much respect and honor in my heart to each of you living set apart. But I do look forward to those who will just be raised in it, and it's all they will know. It's all that, you know, if you're an American-born woman, of course you haven't been raised this way, but you can imagine if this lifestyle is all that you knew from birth, like it is for some of our young women and young sons, then, of course, they're going to fully embrace it and love it, and that's what it's about, too. So the selflessness and the sacrifice I really appreciate and the tearing down that the father does before he builds up I appreciate, too. Um, Do you want to add anything, or can I ask another question? You can move on, sis. All right. Um, 
would you have any specific advice that you would give to someone who's brand new to it or just even trying to embrace it? Absolutely. Uh, there, There's so much <laughs> that I would say. Um, I think for myself, it, it really came down to a decision that I had to make. And I had a desire, I really, really had a desire, um, righteousness. And there was a sister who told me and would remind me that you be righteous, you be righteous. And that just stuck with me so much is that I had to choose righteousness. And it was a decision that I was going to have to make every day. Every day, because what we're doing and restoring y'all's culture is just so different than anything we've ever known to do in any way that we've ever known to be like. And I have, every day you choose righteousness. Now that choice begins to get easier. And um, a, a thought that I would have is that, like, for example, if let's say an elder took another wife and add it to his home, then I personally would be like, wow, congratulations, Elder. That is so beautiful. Look at your home increasing. And I would then congratulate that sister and be like, congratulations, sister. I am so happy that you are covered um, by this righteous man. So then how could I not be happy in my husband's home? And how can I not be happy for my sister wife? That would make me a hypocrite. And I'm like, I am not going to be a hypocrite. Sisters, we will not be hypocrites. Like, y'all will not be mocked by me. And um, these are the things that I would decide for myself. I decided what characteristics that I desired to possess and exude. I desired to be Yah-fearing. I desired to have the law of kindness on my tongue. I desired and and um, determined myself to be friendly and to be a friend so that I could truly have a friend. I desired and determined myself to be submitted and obedient and agreeable to my husband. And I really wanted and desired wisdom in that regard um, so much that I wanted to be like Sirach says, addicted to that wisdom and um, and obtaining it. And, um, yeah, I just would not, I would just not allow myself to be the wrong type of example because you're going to be an example either way. You're going to be a good example or a bad example. And myself being a lead sister on a growing community, sisters are looking at me, you know, with whatever eye they're looking at. They're looking. And what is it that I want to show for my husband's home, how do I want to um, to how do I want to uh, show myself as a daughter of Zion? This was my opportunity, or this is my opportunity to truly walk out my head covering and my skirt. Literally, we can wear it. We can wear a head covering and a skirt that doesn't make us righteous. You know, it doesn't make us holy. You can really have an opportunity to show Yahweh that you are faithful, that you are a faithful daughter and that, you know what, I'm going to make your ways my ways and I'm going to make your thoughts my thoughts and I'm committed to that. So um, I just would, um, the advice that I would just give is to just be um, determined and and determine yourself to be a particular way and really strive towards that. Should others be intimidated by polygynous couples and women? Should everyone be staring and watching and looking and glaring? Can we get past that? One day, when it's when it's just very normal, you know, our children and their children and their children, they'll be past that because it'll be normal to them. But a lot of people are watching. Yeah, I w- I would watch. You know, because you want to know, how does this work? You know, you and, and it's not so much talked about it. I mean, it's hard to put yourself on a sword in, in this type of life because you're learning as you go. You know what I mean? You're you're learning and it's just 
that's just the way that it is. But people are going to watch, and that's why I said, what kind of example are you going to be when they're watching? What did you do or how did you uh, let go of control? So um, I think one thing that uh, really holds us back as sisters is um, this masculine spirit that causes us to believe that somehow, like, our husbands are our possession or that, you know, we are smarter than them and they don't know women like we know women. And they need us to um, to help them. And, you know, we have to shed that masculine spirit because that would have us to think that somehow, you know, um, we need to help them. And that's just not the case. So, you 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 shed that control by realizing that you're not in control, that you are the possession. I think a good example is that of that is when you see um things done righteously in Israel and you see women who um are marrying as virgins and they actually are being paid for with a bride price. And um and no, you know, we're not selling women like people might think in the world, but this is that man's possession, and you're coming to be submitted and obedient to his desires for you. So how dare we go into our marriages thinking that we can control the way it should be or we can dictate and decide when and where and who he can bring into his, a man can bring into his home. Like that's not our right as women, and that's not, that's not the way we should be at all. Do you teach your children about the restoration of biblical family, or or do you just allow them to watch it and grow with you? So um, my husband's sons are uh, a little bit older, and it's it's not usually much I have to say. It's more in in what they see. Um, It's more in just... And just our way of life, you know, they regard um, Sister Ajni as their mother. And um, it's just very normal to them. Like, I remember kind of treading around it kind of softly in the beginning when it was first coming to be. And it was just like the boys were so excited and it was like so normal and they had no struggle. And I thought about that as well, like when we had – my husband's youngest, or not the youngest daughter between he and I, and when we had her, and they were just so excited for her to be born and be a part of the family, and they didn't have any jealousy. They didn't, you know, say, oh, Mommy, you're spending more time with her, or, oh, Daddy, she's with you more, and, you know, you she's in the room with you all, and y'all are together all the time. Like, they never thought like that. These are thoughts that the children never had, so... um the word tells us to be like little children, and they were excited, and I'm, I was going to be excited too. So these are things that I was able to learn from their example as well. So it's just normal to them. Hallelujah. What are the ways that another shy or another woman coming in behind a principal wife can actually support her through her actions? Perhaps the principal wife is not – asking for anything or expecting anything, or maybe she's even learning herself. But as a, uh additional wife, how would you um, ask her or instruct her to, to help or to know what to do to build a relationship with that woman? So I think, um, are you asking, like, maybe how should a, a wife come into a home? Perhaps. Yes, I'm, I think that's the intention of, of the question. This is a question coming from someone living in it. So I think she wants to be able to help um, another woman as well, obviously loving the man, joining in covenant with the man, but wanting to help a, a woman who doesn't um, voice what she may need or want. Yes, ma'am. So I think it's important, um, well, first, again, like, one thing that Pastor Muir said to both me and Ajani in the very beginning is that I want you to be best friends. I want you to be best friends. So when you already understand the assignment, then you already know what the goal is. So you already 
know what it is that we're, we're both here for. So we're here to be best friends. So that means we need to be open. We need to be vulnerable. It was things that I'd be like, oh, we can't talk about that. And he'd be like, talk about it. You know what I mean? Like, you know, so he wanted us to be very, very close and have a special type of relationship. And so one thing that um, I was probably a lot like that sister who maybe didn't say a lot of what she needed, but Ajani would just watch me. She would pay it wherever I was, she would be. You know, I would try to sneak away and go to the car and nurse the baby, and Ajani would be right there at the window like this, and <laughs> she'd come get in the car and just be with me. She knew what I needed. She knew where I needed help because she took the time to pay attention. Now, I'm not saying that a sister needs to be like, you know, doing doing a whole bunch to, to figure out what you need because you're not voicing it, but I am saying that it is helpful that she would do, you know, whatever she can to, to try to figure out what her sister might need. And that just comes from paying attention. And then same thing, like now my sister has twins and she's a first time mother. So wherever it is that I can help, wherever it is I can put my time and my energy and my effort, I would do the same thing for her just as she's done for me. So I think if you just, pay attention to your sister and watch her, you could really learn a lot. How do you build up your sister? Um, how, do you, how do you build up one another in the home, even if it's not your sister? Let's say it is uh, your your master, your covenant master. Uh, how do you build up one another in the faith? What's some practical things that might come to mind? Yes, ma'am. So I enjoy being an encourager for my sister. Um, again, we are not in competition. Um, so I can see my sister and be like, wow, sis, you're so beautiful, you know, or that's a really beautiful outfit on you today. Or, you know, look at the strides you've taken. Like, I've seen you grow so much in these past couple of years. Like, I want to be my sister's biggest cheerleader. And because of, you know, my husband, he played sports. And so him and the brothers, they're very competitive. So, like, I I get that at times, too. And I'm not going to allow any other sister to be more supportive to my sister than I am. So if my sister, you know, comes to me with, like, okay, another thing my husband always says is there's going to be a lot of first times. So it's going to be a first time you're going to have to overcome a lot of things. So my sister comes to me and she says, I'm pregnant. You think I'm going to allow for some other sister to be more excited for her than I am? You know, that's my sister is the way I see it. You know what I mean? So I'm going to be her biggest encourager. I'm going to be the happiest for her at all times. And that's the way that my husband would want it, and that's the way that we are. Hallelujah. Do you have anything, before I just continue with my questions, do you have anything on your notes? Um, that I didn't want to take away from tonight. Anything that you haven't uh, mentioned, Sister Chris? It's so much, Sister Ashley, but if you have any other questions, I can kind of look through and see um, as you come to maybe something else. Okay, how about this, uh, Sister Sakina? Take me to a, a music break. I'll let you look over your notes. I'm going to come back with you covering everything. Even if I don't get to a single, uh, another question, Sister Chris, and you just roll through with your experience and your understanding, that's what I want to hear. So, uh, Sakina, let's let's hit it, please. She's not here with me. Oh, I know, Judith. Judith's telling me she's not here tonight. She's not here, but she's supposed to
All right, Sister Chris, share your heart, share your notes. Take it away. Yes, ma'am. Um, so just going back to um, the scripture, uh, Sirach 6, verse 17, um, I think about something, too, and um, and how we have an opportunity as um, the principal wife to really uh, direct a friendship and direct a sister. Um, but I also wanted to comment on um, being very careful that you would never um, allow any wickedness in you to desire to dominate or control a sister either. Um, because you, I don't know, it's just a wickedness in a woman who will want to uh, control a sister being vulnerable coming into a home and really desiring that covering and really desiring to um, assimilate to a family. And uh, I can see where um, a wicked woman would really almost try to control or dominate that sister to uh, manipulate a situation. So um, I I began to think about um, spirits that um, we as principal wives or just sisters in general and polygynous homes might um, consider getting deliverance from, if you'd like to go in that direction. Yes, please. Go ahead. Speak freely. Yes, ma'am. So um, we talked about just um, having a controlling spirit. We talked about a masculine spirit. Um, Another thing that um, I've noticed um, in in conversations that I've had regarding polygyny um, and also just in being in being in a polygynous home myself, there can also be um, an obstinate spirit that would want to manifest into um, into the wives who are in polygynous homes. And uh, if you're familiar with, with that type of a spirit, it, it, it's like a bullheaded spirit and which would want you to desire your own will, you know, and would cause you to... Um, want to go in a particular way, or you might hear, I don't want to, but I don't want to, and I will not. And so um, every day uh, for myself, I bind up an obstinate spirit that will want to do its own will and make its own way, because that is not the way that we should be operating as daughters of Zion. You know, I always um, say, not my will, but thy will be done. Um, because my desire is the desire of the Most High for his branch to be beautiful. And so um, those are the things that I strive after. Um, Another spirit that um, I've come across is an apathetic spirit. And there's actually a whole uh, sister sister broadcast about that as well. And it's like a spirit that would cause you to, to think that you just don't care. You know what? I just don't care. It's not going to bother me because I don't care. And um, that's no way to approach this type of life either because uh, my husband would also drill into me and remind me to embrace it. You have to embrace it. You know, you don't want to just, just, you know, jump from, you know, from a, a, a high um, balcony or something. Like, you, you just need to really embrace the situation and uh, embrace embrace the lifestyle, embrace the culture, embrace this new normal instead of being apathetic and nonchalant and not non-caring about the things um, that are going on. And um, those are some, some of the things that have helped me along the way that I just thought I would share. Yes, ma'am. Please continue. What else you got? Yes, ma'am. Um, I talked about um, really having an opportunity to um, walk out, you know, your righteousness. A lot of the time, uh, you hear the brothers talk about the footwork, and and that is in, you know them forsaking all, you know, them uh, learning Yahweh's ways and uh, learning to build and 
learning to be uh, farmers in that regard. And, you know, as sisters, we make changes as well. But like I said, it's more than just wearing a head cover and a skirt. It's really committing yourself to uh, this life and its wholeness. Like, I know when I came into the faith, I was really, when I heard truth, I understood it, I recognized it, and I knew it was true. Um, but I realized that that's just not enough. Like, you, it's not enough to just know that this way of life is okay and that it was biblical and that some men chose it and some didn't for whatever reason. Like, that's just not enough. And the Most High will really challenge you and take you on your word. You know, um, like I said, he will not be mocked and his name will not be in vain. And I realize that in my own life is that for those of us who truly fear him and truly desire more of him, you might think like, you know, Father, I want you to teach me to be patient. And you think he's just going to be like, okay, daughter, you know, and he's just going to bestow patience upon you. But no, he's going to put you in a situation where you're going to actually be able to learn patience and you're going to really be able to be tested on that to see if you're really getting it or not. And that's what I found um, this walk to be to be like. I enjoy listening to you speak. I enjoy your maturity and your experience, honestly. So I'm just going to keep going. All right, says Chris, what else you got uh, until you get empty, if you even do. So please continue. I would often think as um, a wife and a mother, this was even before the faith, I would consider um, that if, y'all forbid, if anything ever were to happen to me, you know, who would really be able to love and nurture um, my my husband and my children? Like, who would really be able to pour into them the way that I would want them to be poured into, the way that I would want them to be taught and be able to care for my husband, you know, during, you know, in my absence? And um, I think that's the beauty in polygyny is that when you have a sister wife who is um, just willing to learn and willing to um, come into your husband's home and assimilate and really watch and pay attention and you can, and you can really pour into her. Like um, pastor would say to me often, like, do you realize how sister Ajani really sits at your feet? Like she really would humble herself to find herself at her feet to really listen to me and really hear from me and really understand my heart as a wife and as a mother. And this was before she was ever a part of my husband's home. And those are the type of qualities that um, that I think are, are very valuable to anybody's household. And, um, and so in my heart's meditation, you know, um, I never knew that the father would really bless me in that way and have a a sister wife who knows exactly how I am as a mother and would mother my children and love my children the way that I love them. And I would never have to worry about that um, if I were not here for whatever reason. And I'm really, really grateful to to have that, to have her as my sister in that way. It's definitely inspirational and um it's you know I stand in awe you know when you when you can find a woman like that that has uh the willingness to join a, a man and his family and to love them both and to serve the most high with fear uh it's so commendable it really just melts my heart i don't know what other words to say with it but please continue Yes, ma'am. Um, again, I told you one of my goals is really just to encourage the daughters as I am. Like, I want us to be so encouraged about this way. Like, I really do because what I've realized since coming into the ministry and hearing Pastor Dow speak about um, how originally he would say, you know, only less than 5% of men will have uh, more than one wife in this ministry, and that's okay. That's their choice. And um, what you see now, though, is it's not just pastor and elders, et cetera, who 
um, are taking on multiple wives, there are other righteous men in this ministry who are willing and able to cover cover more than one woman. And so I think it's just really something that I would like for us to prepare our hearts for. Like, you can't know until you're in it, you know, what it's going to be like. Like, even with my testimony, like, your testimony might be very different. You know, you might be, have a very different perspective about polygyny. You know what I mean? But you can't know until you're in it, but I really, really can't express it enough. I really want us to really be active in the renewing of our minds and really change, like really figure out what those inner uh, thoughts are that we have about polygyny and really work at um, and being different on the inside because it'll when it comes to your doorstep, you don't want it to fall down on you is what I'm trying to say. And I encourage my sisters here uh, often, I tell them often, if you know a righteous sister and you think she'd be good for your husband's home, tell your husband. Please tell your husband. Like, we should really, the same way when you meet a sister and, you, and you're like, sis, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believe? Like, I know I do that. You know, I meet a new sister. I'm like, sis, you got the Holy Spirit because my sisters know one of my favorite things to do is to tarry for the Spirit. I'm like, sis, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Same thing. You know, if you know a sister who is a good, righteous sister striving for Yah and could only be better if she had a true, righteous covering, tell your husband. Tell your husband and, and don't avoid it like the play because he might have already considered it anyway. So don't be afraid of it. I remember there was a um, a mother's meeting at the feast, um, one tabernacle, and Mother Carol said, daughter, face your fear of polygyny. And when I tell you that shook me to the core because I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> I was like, what does that mean? And it really caused me to dig deep, to truly dig deep and really, really ask the Father, like, what is that fear that I have? You know, because I would have been like, I'm a sound-thinking person. I know that it's okay. You know, I know it's not wrong. I know that it's biblical. But what is that fear that was there? Why did that res- resonate with me so heavy? And um, I was really able to take some time and dig deep and really figure out what those things are. And when it comes down to it, it's just a lot of projected fear, like we talked about earlier. It's a lot of things that are really, in the grand scale of things, just unrealistic. You know, like I said, you think your husband won't love you anymore. That's ridiculous. Do you have a, a righteous husband? Like, really challenge these thoughts, like, Casimir always says, like, are you listening to the pool guy again? Like, stop listening to him. Stop allowing the Hasatan into your mind because you, your mind will just be the devil's playground if you allow it to be passive. We have to be active, sisters. We really, truly do. We really have to stop allowing the Hasatan to have a field day in our minds and just allowing it to go any which way without really holding those thoughts captive and really challenging it. Like, hold on, no, my husband loves me. He told me that. He told me he loved me. You, like, really have to believe what the truth is because another thing he would say to me and says to us all often, is that truth or is it feelings? And when you really stop your thoughts that same way, you can challenge them the very same way. Like, hold on, no, is this the truth or is this just my feelings manifesting? Hallelujah. Hey, I'm going to play a clip. Let's go back to August 2019, Q&A with Mother Carol. It's a one-minute clip. You mentioned projected fear, so it fits. Hallelujah. Um, the fe- one of the fears that mostly I think I, I have spoken with sisters about, and I'm, it's called projected fears, just as Job did in, in Job 3 and 25. If you go back and look, he said, the thing that I greatly feared has come upon me. I call it the what if fear. What if? I hear a lot from daughters of Zion. Well, what if this happens? 
What if my husband does this? What if my children do that? What if this doesn't happen? What if he can't provide for me? What if all of your fears are something that has not even taken place, something that you know nothing about, and it takes away from your trust in Yah, because if you're trusting in Yah to lead your husband or the elders over you or even lead you as you're single, if you're single, you're you're taking away from the trust in Yah that he is going to work everything out for you. It is not going to come without tribulation because we all must go through things to be proven, to be tried. But your what if is total opposite to your faith. And you can't say that you have faith if there are no works, if there's no enduring substance to even wait long enough to see if what you're doing and what your belief is going to be manifested. You have to take time for it to manifest, for it to take place within you, for y'all to see if you're ready for the end of it, for the end of your faith, for the end of that belief that you're believing in. Hallelujah. Fit perfectly. Uh, anything to add? And please move through your notes. I'm enjoying it. Hallelujah. Um, just a couple more things um, that I wanted to say in response <clears throat> to Mother, just in the same vein. Just think about um, how the word says that the Most High is, um, and this this is just me paraphrasing, but He's faithful to finish the work that he began in you um, until, you know, the the return of Christ Jesus. And so I think about um, if the Most High has brought you this far and he called you out of this wicked and perverse generation and he set you apart to be his daughter, um, then he has something very different for you. And he is faithful to complete that work that he began in you. And you just have to trust him. You just have to trust him. And I believe that um, a lot of our issues as daughters of Zion and a lot of those what ifs and those projected fears just really stem from a lack of trust in Yah and really come into the realization that we don't know him the way that we think that we do. You know, we did not even discuss any of this before the show. Um, I simply reached out to Sister Chris and said, hey, uh, I'm going to interview. That's what I want to do. You know, Pastor wanted us to talk about it, wanted me to, you know, interview Sister Chris and, and, and get her to openly communicate, you know, her heart to all of you. And so it's interesting. I have another clip. It's my last one for tonight, but it fits exactly what you just mentioned. So... Let's go back to August 2019 with Mother Carol. Let's see uh, her heart's her thought on your trust. Well, your trust has to be in the most high. That the people are one thing about it. We think that as humans on this earth, that we're not fallible and flawed, but we are. We hurt each other. We do each other wrong. We pick ourselves back up. We repent, and we do it again. And sometimes it takes a while, but we do it. Again. Come on, have your trust in the most high, Yah. And then you will trust in him to lead and guide all of those around you. But if you can't open yourself up enough, you'll be the one that suffers from never being able to receive the love and the trust that the Father has for you because you can't open up yourself. He's going to show you how to trust through his people. So you have to open yourself up to be able to be trusted and to trust others so that you can show y'all I, my trust is in you, and I know that you're going to work out every situation with those that are around me. All right. So Hallelujah. Well said from both of you, Sister Chris. Go ahead. Hallelujah. Um, Sister Ashley, I think I'm very close to the end of my notes. Um, yeah, if you had any other questions, I'd be happy to answer. Sure, let's uh let's go back to some of the thoughts that I have from the sisters I reached out to. Um, I kept the notes from August twenty nineteen, um, from Mother Carol, I just pulled them out today. And this is in her, her words, you know, Pastor discusses biblical marriage 
So I'm going to be discussing uh, polygyny in detail as well. We're learning it as he is being directed by the father. And this is all typed up. These are her notes. It said that, first of all, many of you are very concerned about your husband taking another wife. It is his right. However, if he is not able to provide for you and protect uh, you or what he already has, then he has no business taking on any more responsibility. There are several um, polygynous families in this ministry that are in counseling even with pastor, and there's a problem that he's noticed amongst women, and some are coming out of other relationships where it seems as if the fault was all the man. And as he is seeing through all of this, meaning pastor seeing through all this, they're coming out of relationships where the fault was so-called all the man, and pastor seeing in those women that the women are requiring so much more out of this new um, biblical um, polygynous relationship this new covenant that they've made, and they that they have actually completely in, ignored one another. And he says, it is total hypocrisy, which you mentioned earlier, Sister Chris. And her note says that if you never gave your husband the time of day, but then you come into this new relationship by choice, knowing that you are not the only one, then why would you require all his time, all his attention, all his energy, and you wouldn't give a tenth of that in the previous relationship? thus stressing him out and stressing out this new man that's trying to cover you. It is the epitome of selfishness. And she reminds me often that hidden hypocrisy is open scandal and glory. But that's a good note. And I'm jumping back to a note from 2004. 2004. This particular note and this piece of paper was typed by Pastor Dow when I used to um, retrieve his notes. Remember, Grandma Barb? Yes, I used to retrieve his notes when they would lay around or they would be at the pulpit. Or um, He's even, like, he had an old shed, and even his old trailer where he had lots and lots of stuff, lots of printed things, CDs, tapes. No, I didn't take until someone else beat me to it went before me, kind of made it all a shuffle and a shambles, boxes everywhere, didn't put things nice and neat. And, yeah, he said I could take it. So I got some stuff from there, too. And so what I mean by that is just a little a smile and a shout-out to those who live on community where you try to tuck something away in a storage facility, and then before you know it, it becomes all the saints anyway. That's what happened to all of his <laughs> breaching and his things. Did you get blessed by that way, too, Grandma Barb? Oh yes, she said. I got tons of CDs from an old uh an old shed that he had some boxes of preaching in and um Mother Carol bought supplies, you know, things to from shampoo to deodorants to thing homesteading things, items that you need for years to come. You know, we would buy totes of it. And so when she went in with the goods, that stuff got shuffled and once again I got blessed. Anyway, this note is from two thousand and four from a, a preaching of Pastor Dallas when he used to type everything before it went on the screen, which you see now each Shabbat. And he says, men, you expect for your women to fall in biblical order, but I say you need to fall into order. Get in your place, and the women will get into theirs. And the reason why the woman is not in her place is because of a lot of sorry men that are not in theirs. I do not teach women to be a whipping post for any man's ignorance. Many men think because they are men, they can allow ignorance to rule them and their houses. Women, speak the truth, no matter how uncomfortable it may be. Men have no problem telling you the truth concerning themselves. Women don't rebel. And the only reason I brought it out is not to reach any form of a man or speak to him at all, but just so you know that the balance of the ministry does really hit both man and woman. And then you can hear from the words of mother that I read earlier in, in her notes where she's coming from, which is the teachings of her own husband. Remember, they've been married 40 years. They've known each other for 40 years. Um, one of the things that Mother Jennifer has said uh, Sister Chris is that many women do try to prepare themselves for polygyny, but the ultimate lesson really comes when it hits your doorstep, and I believe you've made that uh, impact tonight as well. And she says that you realize how difficult you are to love at times and how impatient you are at times, and to her it shows the greater capacity that the man has in his area of love compared to a woman, meaning how much 
he's willing to love a woman. Uh, that's one of her concepts and one of the things that she really has grasped and understood, living a life like yourself. And to me, it's really honorable just from the outside looking in to, to know that everyone in the home, no matter how many children or how many women, everyone depends on the man. Every provision, every battle, every trouble, every question, every sock, every shoe, the fridge, the freezer, and every bill, it all needs him. Um, and so do, do you want to add to anything that I've said up until now, Sister Chris? Yes, ma'am. Um you know what, I, I wanted to um, point out the fact that we are um, in a very righteous ministry. We are a part of something that very few people can um, can can say they, they are a part of. Like, this ministry is just so beautiful, and Pastor Dow is so um, involved. He really is, though he be one person. He's very much so involved in even just um, seeing how he is very patient and he encourages, I know with my husband and um, and adding to his family, he would encourage my husband also to be patient, which he was um, during the process. It's not something that happens overnight, you know, it's, at least in my experience. So, and that that's what I want to make sure I'm clear because I don't know anyone else's experience in that, but it doesn't happen overnight. You really take the time to get to know each other. Like, this is something that we're doing for life, so it's not something that you get in and then you realize, oh, no, this isn't a good fit. It won't work out. No. This is something that we're doing for life, and this is the restoration, and we take it slow, and we really – um like I said, we we um, get to know one another, and we really see how we all come together as a family unit. So it's not just an overnight process. And in that, though, um, as wives, as principal wives, it's important to um, be a peace for your husband. Like, you don't want to be just nagging in his ear, complaining and finding neg- negative things about, you know, your potential sister wife and, you know, because... I'm sure, I know for myself, I wasn't perfect, and I still am not perfect. You know what I mean? And y'all forbid my sister wife would tear me apart to my husband, you know. So um, I I would desire to, um, my husband would say, I, I just want this to be a peaceful experience, you know. So you want to be a peace for him when he comes to you, because it's a lot of energy. It's different for him, too. You have to be understanding that. This is new for um, the man as well. And um, and so you want to have a peaceful uh, or a peace about yourself as the woman. And you also touched on, um, or I think Mother Jennifer talked about how a man's capacity to love more than one, and I think that's so important to understand. Um, we as women can't understand that. You know, we couldn't, we're not designed to love more than one man. And that's why Elder Rufus talks about how most of the women have, you know, all of these issues going on in their mind because they're, they've, you know, been with so many men. But uh, we could probably understand it only by being a mother, you know, and um, knowing that each child is different. Though I'm the same person, I can still love each of my children differently and care for them differently and give them what they need respectively according to whatever, you know, discernment I have as a mother and giving them the measure that they need. Um, I think that's probably the only way we as women can understand what it's like for a man to love more than one. Um, But other than that, you know, I think – we have to understand that men are just designed differently than we are and um, be content in that. Well said. Um, there is a quote that, gosh, years and years and years ago, um, it was sports that taught it to us. And, you know, I try to really renounce everything that's not of ya, that's associated with anything that I did prior to the most high, but some of those things that really stick with you that are perhaps uh, truthful. Um, one was attitude. You know, it's what I really admire your attitude 
as you express it tonight, even being your husband's or, or your co-wife, your sister wife's um, cheerleader, um, it takes a, a special heart to do that. Uh, it's righteous, though. It shouldn't be an abnormality. But this particular quote was, the longer that I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on a life. An attitude can be as influential as facts. It's as important as any education, any circumstance, any failure, any success. It's as important as giftedness, skill, or any appearance. It'll make or break a company, a church, or a home. And the remarkable thing is that we have a choice every single day regarding the attitude that we embrace for the day. And we cannot change our past. We cannot change the fact that people will act a certain way. We cannot change anything inevitable. Control the controllables, Elder Rob says. But the only thing we can do is play on the one string that we have, and that's our attitude. And all of that summed up says, I'm convinced that life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. We are in charge of our attitude. So I really appreciate your attitude tonight and just wanting everyone to be excited and to really pull back, you know, or, or do your part to pull back the fears and the uncomfortableness and, you know, some of the doom and gloom or the heaviness that, that shouldn't be there, you know, as others try to learn and admire you from a distance. So thank you. Um, let's see. As I look over some of these things, um, how would you instruct or help to sister wives come together with respect and oneness when they have completely different minds and they're completely different women? I think that um, first and foremost, like, why would your husband want to be married to, like, why would Pastor Muir want two Sister Chris's? <laughs> like, it doesn't make sense. Like, you know, he has an, another wife because, you know, for whatever reason, but she's different than me. We're not the same. Um, and that's beautiful. Like, that's okay. We don't need to be the same. You know, uh, maybe Ajani is, like, more social. Like, she's naturally just more like excited than me like all the time like she goes and she's like wow we like if you know Ashley, she's just like so happy and cheerful and me I'm very joyful but I pretty much keep it neutral majority of the time like we are completely different and that is okay again like we don't need to be the same you know what I mean we need to be of the same mind and I think that if sisters don't have the same mind then maybe that's um, they need to be more on one of a court, one of a court with what their husband would have for them because we should always be of the same mind. We should always have the same goal and the same mission, though we be different. <laughs> so um, I think there's very there's beauty to be found in the differences, but um, again, we should be still striving towards the same goal. Hallelujah. Um, do you believe you are truly a wife? Absolutely. Absolutely, I'm truly a wife. And um, yes, yes, ma'am, I am truly a wife. Hallelujah. And for anyone listening, that question comes from um, our understanding and the administration of the word of the Most High, who says that a, a wife is agreeable. You know, a wife is agreeable, and you're not just a wife because you're married. So she's coming from that aspect. Another statement, and not a question that maybe you could add to, from a woman who lives the life. Um, she says, be submissive not only to your husband, but also to the principal wife. She can teach you a lot. Have a willing heart. Don't have unrealistic expectations of marriage or of a family life which can be very worldly expectations, and don't covet. Sister Chris? Yes, ma'am. I, I talked about coveting earlier. You, know, you definitely should not covet your sister. Um, you shouldn't covet the relationship that she has with, you know, your husband, like, because that's her husband, and it's just as much her husband as your husband. So, um 
we definitely shouldn't be covetous. It's so important uh, because the enemy will will try to get your thoughts to go in a direction where you can pick apart your sister, you know, because that's just the nature of women. But, um, but yeah, I mean, women, we as uh, the older women or the principal wife in the, in, in the relationship, we should be willing to share with the younger sisters. You know what I mean? We should be willing to allow them to be at our feet. You know, we should encourage them. We should um, learn from them as well. You know, it's plenty of things that I'm able to learn from my sister. I'm not just um, in a role where only I can be the teacher. No. Even though she's younger than I am, you know, there's still so much that I've been able to to witness of her character and be able to um, to uh, desire that for myself without being coveted. You know, so we have a lot to teach each other, and um, it's nothing wrong with that either. Hallelujah. Um, I wanted to say, let's see, we talked about control. We talked about being an example. I'm going to roll down through here before we conclude the show. We talked about restoring biblical family through the children and teaching them bringing women together respectfully into one mind. One woman said that aside from being a mother, and this is, once again, another sister who lives it within our fellowship and ministry, aside from being a mother, polygyny is saving me. It's maturing me. It's healing my emotions because it shows me the true intricacies of my heart and how much hell I have. It's teaching me love and serving another woman as myself, not just the husband. So we all should already be willing to do that part once entering the covenant. It causes me to seek the kingdom even more and what I once feared. I love more and more after every victory won. Sister Chris? Yes, ma'am. I mean, that sister is right. I am right there with her. And, um... Um, the truth of the matter is, you know, I don't know if I was going to truly be kingdom bound without polygyny. And that might hit somebody hard, you know, because if you know you're gonna you're going to the kingdom, I'm not trying to take that from you. But for myself, I have been able to be challenged in a way that I would have never been challenged. I've gotten deliverance for things that I would have never even considered before um, polygyny. I've really been able to see myself in a particular way that I would have never seen myself had it not been for this way of life. So, yes, I mean, that sister, I mean, I want to hug her and I want to encourage her because that's just the truth right there. I mean, we really um, have had to die to ourselves in so many ways that you couldn't even imagine. You know what I mean? And, and really began to learn ourselves differently. And I'm just very grateful. Um, like you, maybe you might say motherhood has challenged you in that way or community has challenged you in that way or just, you know, being righteous has challenged you in that way. But I have not for myself been challenged and I've not grown as much as I have in these past three years and I don't know that I ever would have had it not been for polygyny. Hallelujah. I'm going to go back to August 2019, a note from Mother Carol, and this is just um, in reference to marriage. In the first few years, let's say the first 10, you're a novice, you're new, marriage is new, you're learning each other, maybe the babies are coming, uh, you're working towards building a house or getting things, constantly learning more and growing uh, uh, with each other, really developing. In the next years, in the next set of years, you know what to expect from each other. If you're struggling, it's definitely evident by now. And some of you get bored or maybe discontent, but by this time you're having serious problems that can make or break your entire relationship. And in the next phase of years, you're still together, you're settled, you're more balanced. You know neither of you are going anywhere, and you have by now pretty much weathered every storm imaginable. And this is, once again, coming from a woman woman married for 40 years. 
So your love has grown, it's blossomed, it's strong, it's confident. You both operate in your roles, you're content, and you're at peace. And in this walk, this endurance is a good representation of having tenure even with the father. Does anyone have it down perfectly? Of course not, but we can look around to those with tenure, which means those who have been here for a while. And because all that they have gone through things, uh, not everyone with years of experience, of course, is a good example. Be very discerning, but uh, she does give, you know, that balance or that perspective of your growth in your marriage being just like those who have been with the Father for, for many, many years. So all praise and all stop for that reflection. Um, I think I want to also just remind everyone, I purposely monitored, like, how many people were watching. Maybe you did, too, uh, Sakina. We started out with a lot more than we have now, I meaning listening to tonight's show. And that really proves the heart of, of women um, you can blame it on, you know, maybe some are working and some had to exit or, or leave for other things. I, I usually, I don't even, I do not pay attention to the numbers. But tonight I did on purpose because of the topic. Um, and, you know, this is not, as I said earlier, when we talk about this dynamic of our culture, it's not Muslim and Mormon, it's not the Church of the Latter-day Saints, it's, we're not Nigeria and Tanzania, we're set apart, we are, it's our lifestyle, it's our custom and tradition, it's part of everything that we do, it's not what we do as Hebrew Israelites and then this is a little bitty section over here, It's it really is a part and it's something that the Father has restored in his timing and his way, so we must acknowledge his heart in it, no matter what faults we may find with um, ourselves, in ourselves, or other people, what offense we may have, what evil eye or finger pointing we may have, or just criticism that we could have towards the lifestyle. It simply is a part of being a Hebrew. It's the package, it, or it, it makes, uh, you know, it makes up the package. And um, I think you've given great advice on how to just get to a place where it should be a part of you or something that you don't fear. Um, and I really respect all your words. I respect everyone who's living it. I truly do. Yah knows my heart. I've never had a chance to express that, to say thank you to those who are selflessly living it, who are able to walk in front of us uh, on behalf of anyone or everyone who may have caused any, you know, staring, glaring, oppression, or, or just simply curiosity by watching you. Um, my apologies. But it is your role, you know, it is your lot to go forth and to go first and to show us the way, and I, you know, pay honor and respect to those who are going through it um, together, you know, with one another, and growing, and loving the Father, and being willing to die to yourself, because it is His heart, it is the Most High Yah's heart, um, so thank you for that. Um, Sister Chris, is there anything else you'd like to say uh, to wrap up your thoughts tonight? Thank you for coming on. Yes, ma'am, I just have a, a thought, and then... Um... I can uh, end with a scripture as well. And um, just in reference to the restoration, you know, something that really encourages me, like really motivates me and brings me so much joy is when I think about the day that the sky is cracked open and Jesus is coming down, and he looks, and he says, those are my people right there. Those are the ones who are committed to my way and restoring my culture. <clears throat> and that's what, I'm, that's what I'm a part of, that restoration and restoring y'all's culture. And I think about um, when I'm in the kingdom and I see my mother, Sarah, because the word says whose daughters you are if you do well. And I see Sarah. And Sarah says, wow, you did it. You did it, daughter. You did it. I don't know how you did it in this culture, in this, in this world that you live in, but you did it. And that just encourages me. It motivates me. It excites me. And those are things that I look forward to. And I'm not going to miss out on that. And I just encourage the sisters who are living this life and walking this walk to look at, to be encouraged for that day where we can stand together before our mother Sarah and she can just encourage us and wonder how we did it and we can tell her, you know. So that's that's just something that is, is constantly on my heart 
and I wanted to share that. Hallelujah. It's touching. I was in tears for sure, you know, visualizing it with you and and it's been a it's been a ride for, for myself through the faith with the saints, you know. Sixteen years and I'm still hey, not tired yet, huh, Grandma Barb? Hallelujah. Running for our life and her at 22 years, 23 years with the Father. I pray that each of you will find enduring substance and really just get lowly and talk to the Father about your ways not being his. Hallelujah. Sister Chris, I'm going to end tonight with a song. Is there anything else you'd like to say? Um, Blessings to all of Goshen, to the Lion's Den, specifically to Pastor Daniel and, and Elder Deacon there, everyone who supports all of you, thank you so much for your love for the Father, your example. I've been delighted ever since each of you have come into the way. Hallelujah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, just lastly uh, share a scripture that also encourages me, and it's Ecclesiastes 4, um, um, 9 and 10. And it says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his, I'll say, one will lift up her sister. But woe unto her that is alone when she falleth, for she have not another to help her up. Hallelujah. Thank you all for tuning in. Thank you for listening. Uh, so, so few of us will live it, will fear it, and will hear it. Praise Yah. And only 40 people got to hear it tonight. Out of all the earth, imagine. Praise Yah. Bless you, Sister Chris. Here we go.